<laughs> I was actually it's lovely to hear. I just I was, wish I understood it. <laughs> you do, you just don't know you understand it. Yeah, well, yeah, sometimes you can yeah. kind of do that with See? languages on cadence, I agree. But. Or we could just go directly to an actual language like Swedish. Yeah. <laughs> Which you don't speak, Neil? Oh, I, um, hi everybody, I'm Neil. I, I was waiting to finish your Unamunda story before I clicked the video link, so forgive it, it didn't want to interrupt. Um, no, I don't speak Swedish, but I'm learning Dutch. I'm now in Belgium, having left um, Australia about six months ago. So, so I'm apparently having you're all, the all the fun and games of trying to pick up the different nuances and the syllables and the different pronunciations. <laughs> yes. So apparently you're in the Dutch speaking part of Belgium? Yes, Flanders. Yeah. Have you seen the, the comedian who explains Belgium and politics? No. OMG. Please hold. I'm going to consult my brain and find that because it's, uh, it's really, really good. And this guy, um, he's got an evening show. He's sort of like the John Stewart of, uh, of Belgium. Mm. I'm a documentary. Is it this one? Yes. His, uh, the name of the show is Zondag mit Lubach. And his name is Arjen Lubach. And here is, uh, here is the video. Oops, come on, brain. You got to hurry up a little bit more than that. Da, 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 da. Copy, and I'll paste it in on chat. Uh, <coughs> Good morning, friends. Good morning. How is everybody? Good morning. Great. Lovely, lovely, lovely to see your faces. Um, so our co-conspirators at Collective Next, uh, Matt, Ham, Hank, all have an all hands meeting today. Bad timing. So they would love to be here. They are not able to attend. Uh, they will absorb us virtually at a later moment because I'm going to be posting all of these videos uh, to YouTube, uh, but we can head in. Howard, yay. Philip, I'm going to have to, uh, I'm gonna have to be uh, somewhat passive because I'm also dealing with some uh, community center issues. We run a community center and service our local Lower East Side New York City community. Which must have been still crazy times. Um, I can. It's been, it's been, you know, obviously hard for a lot of our neighbors. I'm actually trying to work with a autonomous collective that wants to have free refrigerators on the sidewalks to figure out how we can provide them power so that they can fill it with food magically and make it give out food for people who need it. Wow. And it's, you know, it's fun and very liberal, and I enjoy it. <laughs> could you could you tap um, somebody at the Japanese consulate to make it vending machines that don't have a price? Because mm. vending machines are used to being outside. Refrigerator is probably not so good. Right. No, we I, we I had all sorts of questions about how are you going to close it to make sure the children don't climb in, and how are we going to keep rats out, and how are we going to keep the sub this you know the sidewalks clean and all that kind of stuff. But apparently, people in the neighborhood will take responsibility for that. So it's an interesting idea. I hadn't heard it before. It's now featured in Eater, and potentially they're doing an article in the Times about these kinds of things. So we're trying to get ahead of it. It's like little yeah. lending library. Oh, you could have very tiny fridges for the rats. I mean, like, Howard, you have like a, uh, several like years ago, a special rat dispenser. Hey, Michael, sure. Go ahead, Michael. Howard, several years ago, they solved this problem in India. They actually have these things on the street. Uh, they are vending machines, and they do work pretty effectively. Mm. If you have any thoughts about where one would find such a thing, it's cool. I don't know. You know, we have to figure out how to fund the vending machine right now. We're not funding a lot of our own stuff. This is really, people came to us and said, we see you have a big wall and power, and we have that. And, you know, I've sort of like, yeah, let's figure that out. That's not, that's not a hard ask. Um, <clears throat> cool, like, thank you very much. This, it, it's off topic, but not, because we're trying to sort of devour the universe here and figure out how to make sense of things together. And I really appreciate what you're actually doing in the world as a way of sort of feeding what we're trying to do. Um, many of you have not been part of any of these calls, so I'll do a little bit of what is this, why are we here, uh, and then we can jump in wherever we go. I don't, I, I don't have a, a, a strong agenda here because partly what I'm trying to listen for is where do you all have energy, what, how does this Open Global Mind container fit what you're trying to get done in the world? Um, and so we'll, we'll head there in a, in a little bit. Um, this project kind of starts with my um, having 22 years invested in curating one mind map with this piece of software called the brain. Uh, I, let me just uh, 
let me just share my brain for just a second because it'll make more sense when you see what this is. Uh, the brain is proprietary software and uh, I can't, I haven't been able to match what I do with it. Uh, so here's Belgium and here's uh, this guy Lubach. Uh, I've got this show under talk shows. Uh, and as you'll see, I have a whole bunch of other talk shows here. Um, and I think I need to reboot my brain because my computer is busy spinning. There we go. So here's the O'Reilly Factor on Fox News, Oprah Winfrey Show, uh, Ellen DeGeneres, Graham Norton. You'll recognize a lot of these things, right? Uh, then there's serious talk shows and, and so forth. Um, so I've been feeding this mind map for um, 22 plus years. And it's been um, both uh, enlightening and a little bit frustrating. And one of the reasons it's frustrating is that I've got this weird artifact that I've, that I've curated for a long time and <clears throat> few other people have it. And most other people don't have an organized memory for what they've seen and what they've done for a long period of time. So a piece of this open global mind is, what if more of us had access to something like that, like all of us have access to Wikipedia, right? I ask people, if I'm in front of an audience, I will often say, who has used the Wikipedia in any way in the last month? And 100% of hands go up. And then who has, who has edited Wikipedia in any way? And two hands go up, right? It's like, not a lot of people are participating, but there's this shared asset that's actually pretty good. Hey, Lauren, yay. Um, there's a shared asset that's out there that, that is available to all of us. So, um, and my own, my own sort of take on, on what's happened to us is partly because we don't have a shared memory and we're all drowning in the info flood. Like every, every couple months, somebody invents something like Slack. And it's like, it's not that your email goes away and your texting goes away and you're, you know, it, but now you get to add Slack and now you get to try to figure out which of the many Slack channels, the conversation you remember up here was actually in and so forth. But, but we have few places to curate all of this. So my, my, the, the motivation started there, but then also started from my having been a part of many, many, many um, conferences and events that had graphic facilitation. And I love graphic facilitation. And the first time I saw it, probably like everybody else, it was like, ooh, ah, somebody's actually channeling what we're saying and drawing it really large on the wall. And the, the, the 20th time I saw it, I was like, damn it. When they're drawing on the wall, it's just like they're going to take a snapshot of this thing and mail me a PDF after the, after the event, and, and nobody's ever going to look at that PDF again. It doesn't function as a memory. And when they put a topic on the wall, like racism in America, it's just ink on paper or pastels, and then it's going to turn into pixels. And for me, when I, when I connect to racism in America, I'm connecting to a nexus of the best of everything I've heard about, seen thought about, uh, et cetera, that has to do with racism in America. And it's an ever improving, evolving zone. Uh, one, of the, one of the interesting lessons I learned from using this brain thing, uh, uh, one, of the, one of my fears was that there would be these dark forest parts of my brain, that there would be untouchable areas that were large and were kind of like the, the, the zone you don't want to go into because there are dragons there or gangsters. And it turns out that there are some less organized parts of my brain but there's sort of no part that's dysfunctional after 22 plus years. And a, a tiny bit of that is because I'm a little anal retentive about the brain, which I'm not about the rest of my life, uh, which is kind of interesting. Um, but a piece of that also is that this is a sort of constantly gardening thing. The analogy I use is that I'm like a leaf cutter ant. And do you all know how leaf cutter ants live? Like leaf cutter ants, leaf cutter ants don't eat leaves which is like, okay, so why are they in the trees all day cutting pieces of leaves and taking them into the nest? Well, leaf cutter ants carry all these leaves into the nest where they hand them to sort of the farmer ants, the, 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 other, the other class of ant that's sitting at a fungus. And there is a large fungus that is symbiotic to, to all these ants and termites uh, that sits underground in their nest. And these other ants mulch up the leaves and with their spit, put the leaves basically on the fungus to feed it the fungus metabolizes the leaf malt, the leaf spit, and oozes a nectar that all the ants eat. So by taking care of the fungus, by curating this common good, this common artifact, everybody in the nest, everybody in the tribe basically gets to eat. Um, and it gets really, really, really interesting and detailed when you get into the details. For example, the ants that are right at the, at the coal face, so to speak, um, tending the fungus, have white powder on their thorax and body. That white powder is a bacterium that is a disinfectant for the fungus. 
so that the fungus won't catch a disease from other bacteria that are not so, not so friendly to it, et cetera, et cetera. So, so there's all kinds of really interesting dynamics going on in this ecosystem. And, and for Open Global Mind, we've been borrowing some ecosystem metaphors to try to explain what this is. So, so Open Global Mind is not an attempt to build the next Facebook that happens to be open. You know, I watched Diaspora come and go, and there's been lots of efforts to do that. Um, uh, it's, it's a there's a bunch of things that this sort of isn't. What, I, what, what we're trying to do is create a container within which we could bring highly functional projects that already exist in the world that aren't connected to other things we think they might want to connect to, try to define a connective architecture so that these things can be used together. So that when I'm using something like the brain in the future and someone else is using something like Kumu in the future and someone else is using Mind Manager in the future, those things could actually sort of talk to each other and be used together to visualize something important and tell a story or do some analysis and that they could do so on top of shared open link data. So there's, the, there's like a low level architecture part of this project that's beyond my pay grade because I'm not a, a, an information architect. That is, how do we manage, curate and share data in a way so that it's credible, so that it's linked, so that, um, um, uh, sorry, what's her name? Uh, Nora um, Bateson. Okay. Nora Bateson has a concept called warm data, which is <laughs> contextualized data, data that, ha that carries context, which is really interesting to me. <clears throat> and then, so there's kind of this, this low level layer of data architecture, trustworthy data architecture that's distributed. <clears throat> that doesn't that that includes issues like you own your own data. How do how do we make it so that you know some one company can't corral and then sell off all of our private data, et cetera, et cetera? Then there's a middle layer of what are the tools for analysis, visualization, storytelling <clears throat> that makes sense to use, build, and to try to make them as open as humanly possible, so that we can extend them, riff on them, play with them, and try to figure out what are the business models so that companies that make them, people that use them can make, make a living in some way <clears throat> without locking too much away at all. Sort of, uh, you know, a little bit like open source software has found that you can have a common base of code and then you can customize, you can adapt, you can teach, you can do whatever on top of that shared code base. So maybe we borrow models like that. And then at the higher, in my, in my head, at the higher levels here, um, are things based on one of my beliefs that, um, uh, membership and emotion trump reason most of the time. And that's a thought in my brain I can show you. But, but my, my belief is that, hey, I could create uh, the world's most compelling visualization. I could, I could have impeccable logic about some point I'm trying to make to convince somebody of something. And if believing me means leaving their tribe and being ostracized by the people in their community or the people they've been with for a long time, they will happily overlook logic in order to stay members of that tribe. And I think we all do this. I think that we all have our belief systems and our faith systems and, and we sort of sacrifice working together around facts in order to be members. And, and also we follow emotions faster than, than most anything else. So the top layer of Open Global Mind is about dialogue, deliberation, discourse, bridging the cultural divide, trying to open that door to talk to people who are, who are our, our others with a capital O. And here my heroes or my role models are Daryl Davis uh, and uh, Dia Khan. Uh, Daryl Davis is a black jazz pianist who has made friends with KKK members and has a garage full of KKK robes uh, because through insane patience and open heartedness um, and just visiting and going, and going to KKK rallies um, this man has, has convinced people, he, he asked them, how can you hate me if you don't even know me? And he's had a whole bunch of people, including Grand Dragons, basically leave the KKK, which I think is brilliant. And there's a, there's a really lovely documentary about Daryl. And then there's two younger black men in the, at the end of the documentary who are really criticizing him, saying, what you're doing is worthless. And I don't think what he's doing is worthless. I think what he's doing is essential. Uh, Dia Khan is a Pakistani woman who went to London where she was still sort of persecuted, came to the US, and went right into the lion's den. She basically took a camera and maybe a sound person, I don't know, and visited white supremacists and neo-Nazis in their homes and clubhouses and shooting ranges. And you can see, and she asks them hard, hard questions, unflinchingly. She's just looking at them, asking questions, and you can see them sort of melt and change a little bit. 
uh, and some, several of them leave those movements. So, so partly, I, and I'm really aware of where I'm coming into this from what point of view, I'm also really aware that there's a titanic battle over the scripts in our heads. So, so kind of behind open global mind is the realization and the fear that the, the, one of the battles that's mattered most over all humankind is what are our belief systems? Because from those belief systems we design, we architect our social systems, our ruling systems, our governance systems, our justice systems, everything else. So we have a retributive justice system right now. And one of the things that, that Black Lives Matter and all the protests in the streets have bubbled to the surface is something I'm a huge fan of called restorative justice, among many other things, among you know, defund the police, changing policing and all that. So, so how do we have important conversations like those which are timely, I think, like I call, I call this period the meltdown. So I, I'm, I'm writing a, a, a piece that says, you know, trust, lockdown, and the meltdown. Because right as we thought we were coming out of lockdown, um, a lot of terrible racial incidents with police happened and suddenly the streets were full of an energy that's always been there because we've been suppressing it successfully over time. Uh, and suddenly that was an important conversation. How might we be helpful in that in those many different conversations? Because there, there's there's not one conversation. There's a whole bucket of them. Long intro. Let me pause for a second and see what how this sits in your heads. What you think? Um, uh, Michael points out that there are no people of color in this conversation, which I completely agree with and understand. We've had participation from a few people who are not white, uh, and at this moment, as I said, sent out an invitation, it's pretty understandable to me that, that this may not be the moment for, for people, uh, you know, BIPOC people to participate in something that sounds maybe abstract, maybe um, software-y, maybe geeky. And one of the things I would love to challenge all of us to do is to invite each of us, one or more people who are not like us, into this conversation. And I think that's going to be difficult, but if we're patient and persistent, and, and have sort of goodwill in, in doing so, and do so for the right reasons, which I'm happy to have changed and challenged and questioned, um, I think we need to do that. I think that's urgently important for what we're doing. So thank you for saying that in the chat, Michael. And I haven't caught up with, uh, uh, and, and Michael's asking, what if our belief systems are fra flawed? I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna address a couple of the questions in the chat because they're really good. Um, so one of the things that um, I have uh, and, and I may be completely off on this, but let me show you, because uh, one of the things that I have in my brain that I can easily share out that is openly visible for anybody who visits my brain at jerrysbrain.com is a, an area that I call my belief snapshot. And I wish more people published their belief snapshot in any tool with any mechanism they wanted to. I wish more people did this. And I know that mine is a thicket of thoughts. I know that this is too complicated, so I'm going to apologize right now for the density of this, but I can explain it, right? I can, I can kind of walk through it. So um, I have a whole thought that people are, uh, let's see. Uh, blah, blah, blah. In fact, I have, to, I have to find where some of these things are. So one of my core beliefs is that humans are born into this world, we're good. We're born fully connected to the universe. We're born wanting to figure out what our role in life is. We're not born, and, and it's a perfectly legitimate position to hold that people are born bad. And some famous people like John Calvin, Martin Luther, Siggy Freud, I think Steven Pinker, Thomas Hobbes, um, come from the notion that there's original sin or that people are just born bad and therefore need to be controlled. And you can see immediately that this turns into control <laughs> structures and societies, this turns into how we design our, our, our justice system, what we do, et cetera. So for me, people are born good. We've socialized the heck out of them. So we've kind of destroyed that. And I notice here that um, that thought is not connected to this thought. So oops, I've got to go do that. When we, when we hang up, <clears throat> I've got to come back in here because I have a whole series of thoughts about socialization and its effects on society. And one of my beliefs is that our systems of socialization are basically really screwing us up. Uh, and my, my favorite example for that is a song from the musical South Pacific. There's a lovely little song called You've Got to Be Carefully Taught. <clears throat> and South Pacific is about racism. <clears throat> and the song basically says, we are not born racists, we are made racists. <clears throat> we are taught that by our families, our cultures, our religions, whoever else it is. And I, I, that's one of my beliefs, I agree with that entirely. 
Um, and Jessica Rabbit did put it very, very beautifully in uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit. She said, I'm not bad, I'm just drawn that way. Thanks, Howard. Um, so now let me hit pause. And while I'm sort of growing back up, anybody who feels like it, jump in. Uh, what does this do for you, say for you, et cetera? Uh, I Charles. To, I just, yeah, something kind of quick and a, a, a little bit messy, I was, um, it, but just in terms of the whiteness um, term and, and, and question or sort of labeling, it came up last week too. Um, and, you know, speaking as someone um, who's certainly benefited since my birth from the color of my skin, but also being um, in, in a, in a, in a so-called minority tribe, um, uh, Ju Jews, Judaism, um, you know, and, and, and all of the, the racism and hatred um, brought to bear on, our, on, on that tribe. Um, it, it's complicated. And, you know, I, I, I don't want to offer any particular comment on the label of blackness and Black Lives Matter, because that's an entirely other issue. It's related, but it's, it's complicated. And, and so I just think here in this space, in particular, as a starting point, to just um, say there's no white uh, there's no there's no uh, people of color in the room okay that's that's useful but to say we're all white well that's not so useful thanks thanks charles i appreciate mm -hmm. it uh, judy i was just going to offer a book the origin of others by tony morrison it's a series of three lectures on systematic creation of otherness carried through literature in particular but yeah. broadly speaking Thank I thought it was a short read because it's 129 pages and it took me 10 hours because I kept stopping to think. <laughs> it's part of her Charles Eliot Norton lectures. Right. Um, yes. Thank you. And I have not read them. So I'm going to um, add that to my list or get a Kindle or, or whatever. The other one that's going around here right now is white fragility. Mm -hmm. There's a long and growing list of readings that are appropriate to the moment. Um, and I'm, I'm extremely interested in how I can apply my life energies to be useful in this moment. And it so happens I have these weird power tools at hand, like the brain. Um, and I love recording screencasts and doing all those sorts of things around it. And I'm puzzled why more people don't have their hair on fire, that we lack a collective memory or a com comparable collective memory, meaning OGM is not Wikipedia because in Wikipedia, there's this notion of neutral point of view, which because Wikipedia is supposed to be like an encyclopedia, the community came up with a whole series of norms and working principles. One of which was each page should look like an encyclopedia, which means it needs to be, it needs to not express an opinion, even though it can mention the different points of view in part, you know, there's usually a criticism section or whatever. That's cool, except I think that opinions and points of view are incredibly important. And the more we can articulate our points of view and the supporting evidence or even just the lack of logic, but why we believe this, the more permeable we can become to each other, the more we can understand each other. And I may be wrong about this, I may be totally off base on this, but that's one of my beliefs is that, is that by being a little bit more explicit and by softening ourselves up and entering a place where we can actually converse with each other, we can make progress on this, whatever, and progress is one of these weird words, right? Um, like trust, it's, a, it's one of these words we don't really understand, we use it all the time, uh, like innovation. Everybody seems to love innovation. I have a whole speech I've given on dark innovations, like how, <laughs> how, how many innovations have been really bad for us. Um, so let me pause and see who else would like to jump in the conversation. Uh, Susan. I was just thinking of uh, what this reminds me of is a dilemma in my life or much, much earlier, which was, um, I'll just say this. Uh, I was, I was born a Mennonite, brought up in a Mennonite community, a uh, very closed community, um, and, um, and have some of the same, same experiences on a smaller scale that the uh, Jewish community has. Um, the, when we went to, uh, we went to do service, uh, my, my first husband and I, because he was drafted and it was, had been a great deal of work had gone in to be able to become legally a um, conscientious objector. And the Mennonites, got, Mennonites had gotten their, their services, the Mennonite Central Committee in particular, which was a relief organization. 
I'm not going to go into any more detail. The point was that, so I went, went off to study French and go off to the Congo and, you know, teach English, which seemed like a, a better thing than being a missionary. <laughs> uh, and it's that distinction that I want to come to. It, it uh, so it was um, on the day that we left uh, and we were driving out uh, and it was uh, driving out, the children were throwing rocks at the car. And we had had such an, a dreadful, unbelievable experience with uh, Mobutu and his trip to China and what he had come back to try to do in the country. It was very painful. And I left thinking, you know, I think this business of trying to do good and all of the rest of that, I have no idea how you're supposed to do it. I'm going to stop this and I'm going to go try to do something else, which was in that case, um, I entered linguistics and I thought, why don't I work on their languages and let everybody know that they're full and complete and <laughs> wonderful and everything else. And that was not a mission for me, but it, it was something that I did. Okay, so my question is, uh, so I feel myself coming here and yes, and yes, we're, we're all white. Uh, and, and ha you know, I, I'm looking for ways to sort of navigate that. And so Jerry, when you said at the beginning, um, you know, what is it that we can and should do? Um, that remains my question. Um, and it doesn't have to be that for this group because just because we're all white, but I think we, we need to have that conversation uh, among us as well. And and two things that are also my beliefs um, that I haven't done enough about. And the first one came to me when Me Too was happening, when Me Too was huge on the public sphere. And that was that that Me Too is men's issue. It's not, it, women are the victims, mm -hmm. it's a men's issue. Mm -hmm. and, and now I think that Black Lives Matter is a non-Black people's issue. Uh, that, 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 and, um, I was just, I'm trying to remember which of the many things I saw in the last couple of weeks, but, but basically it was about change. And it said, the thing that's most likely to change somebody is someone who's like 95% of similar opinion to you. You're, you're, you're gonna have a hard time listening to somebody with whom you share 10% of worldview. They're, 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 they're unlikely, not impossible, but they're unlikely to convince you of something or to have you shift and go over someplace else. But somebody who's pretty close to you might actually get you sort of to, to go over and try something or, or, or believe something a little bit different. That's really interesting to me. So I happen to have the probably naive belief that most of my friends and friendships are not racist. I, 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 I have a visceral reaction to racism. I don't like it. I object to it. I don't befriend people like that. I have not actively gone to find people like that and try to do anything. But I think that there's an edge to my friendship circle where there's probably clearly very likely people who have racist tendencies. And I, we probably overlap a whole bunch. And I'm, what is the thing that I can do to have a conversation that they will listen to? Because there's probably a lot of those people. That's probably a large circle, right? And so, and so how between articulation, logic, and visualization, and sitting down for dinner together and being patient and having conversations and everything, all the variants in between, what could I engage in that might make those people permeable to considering other ways of seeing other humans on earth, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm applying here my own worldview and judgment and all that, but, but for me, it feels like if I can focus on that, that margin and be helpful, and be like Daryl Davis and Dia Khan, I might actually be really helpful in that way. And, and that's my current understanding of my intention on that particular thing. Neil. Yeah, just checking in if I could. Uh, thanks everybody. Uh, my first time here, I don't know who knows who and who knows how much history. But I was, I was taking notes on what you're talking about, the open global brain. So I'm just checking in. Is this a generic discussion about how you might use your curated, weird, uh, artifact of 22 years of building in a, in a universal sense, or is this more specifically about the examples you've given around racial, neo-Nazi, Black Lives Matter type issues? Because the worldview element of this inter interacts with every interaction we have, uh, climate change denialism, ecological collapse denialism, etc. Um, are you looking at a, a source of truth and accessibility <laughs> of information that can be shared by people that hold this capacity to communicate across worldviews, or are you looking to specifically address issues associated with 
current crises in America and rippling worldwide around Black Lives Matter, yeah. which we know, of course, are all interconnected. But I'm just trying to work out where are we in this picture, because I'm, I'm a newbie. Thank you. And, and I didn't do a check-in round. I would go straight into conversation. We might want to sort of hit pause for a second and just uh, get to know each other. So I appreciate that as well, Neil. <clears throat> um, and the starting place for this OGM conversation is issues that are hot on the table right now, like the ones we've just been talking about, and the weird fact that I have this 22-plus-year-old artifact uh, you know, using this software that I did not create called the brain, which I have no control over, which is a little geeky and weird. That's just the starting point. I'd be extremely happy if OGM included corporations trying to make better decisions about how to be good citizens or, uh, you know, uh, like any kind of collective decision making you can think of for me fits nicely within the, the realm or range of what OGM is. These are just things that are presenting themselves that are, I will call them juicy because they have energy, they have heat, they have meaning for a lot of people They give us, they can help align us around purpose. <clears throat> and, then, and then I'll say, I think this also is not a mission to articulate and present this particular humanist, leftist, progressivist point of view. I don't know even what to label it because those labels are dangerous. I'm equally interested in taking people who have opposing points of view to mine and helping them articulate their point of view because in my naive belief <clears throat> that exposing these things and making them more explicit softens us and makes it easier to figure out why we think what we think, I think that their articulation of why white people ought to own the country kind of thing might actually lead us toward resolution on those issues in different ways. So I'm fearful, but I, you know, uh, there are, Jordan Peterson might be attracted to use Open Global Mind to articulate some of his strange thoughts. And, and Jordan Peterson is one of these really interesting characters because he's totally, he's attracting a fringe of my friends, right? And I found uh, there's a, there's a uh, trans woman blogger, Natalie Wynn, who, who, blog, who blogs as ContraPoints, <clears throat> who has a beautiful takedown of Jordan Peterson, which I've sort of put in my brain, et cetera, et cetera. And I want to have that conversation. Like, I, like that to me is an opening for going to some deeper place. And, and one of my frustrations is that the news, the entire news media is scalloping along the surface of issues all the time, every day. Uh, an eight minute news story in the local news is a really, really like eight minutes. Oh my God, out of our half hour, <clears throat> that's forever. We don't do that. And in eight minutes, they have to introduce the subject, describe what's going on and then have a cute hook at the end. And, and it's like stupid, right? And, and when we do governance, we have to create a committee and then go send out some research to, to, to do something and then come back and get citizens together for only 90 days to talk about some issue like uh, land use planning or you know, aquifers or whatever. And then they all go away, they sort of melt back into the public. When you know, uh, one day long ago, uh, uh, I remember listening to Jimmy Wales give a speech about Wikipedia and uh, Ratzinger had just been confirmed as uh, the new Pope Benedict. And uh, Jimmy was telling the story that he had gotten a whole bunch of congratulatory emails from journalists <clears throat> afterwards saying, I can't believe how quickly Wikipedia had a fantastic page on, on the new Pope. And he's sitting there talking to us and he laughs and he says like, <clears throat> we, we had a page on every one of the bishops. Like, we, so what somebody did when the white smoke went up was they went to Ratzinger's page, they changed the paragraph, they renamed the page and shabing shaboom had a great page on new Pope Benedict. And, and I was like, why are we busy reinventing and throwing everything away when we could use it in, and improve it the way, the way that good soil improves when you do natural farming? Soil is better for every turn. It gets healthier um, as opposed to being depleted when you use industrial farming. The way the ants that do a good job tending the fungus in their, in their warren, in their nest, have more and more nutrition and have a healthier tribe. Couldn't we collaborate on these sorts of things? including opening the window to potential bad actors and figuring out how to manage that <laughs> without designing in stupid constraints that basically kill our, our ability to converse and to think out loud and to have to step into a place that feels a little bit safe. Even the term safe zones has been politicized and, 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 and turned around. So it's, it's really like the moment is right for something like this. So, so Neil, thank you for, for those questions, they're perfect. Anybody else? Dendritic openness is great. Judy, you love dendrites and, 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 and me too. 
and I love that the thing is called the brain. Um, I also love hyphae, which are sort of the leading edge of mycelial networks. They're called hyphae, the little, the little tendrils that reach out toward each other and make those connections. Um, <clears throat> The thought I was having when I, I do love the word dendritic, it's one of my most favorite words, but particularly in terms of the dialogue that needs to occur, if every person that we <clears throat> touch is influenced in some minimal way by our openness to their point of view, that can spread, I believe. And that's part of my belief system also believes people are basically good, you know, and that we are a product of many different things that have created who we have become. And I remember in the old days of diversity, part of the teaching that reached people was visual diversity is the biggest, tiniest tip of the iceberg of diversity underneath which all of the things that have to do with family, geography, um, sportiness, whatever, reside. And many of those are underwater because no one talks about them because they're tender, if you will. <laughs> and so if, if we want a community that's more connected, then some sort of firm commitment to genuineness and openness is I believe the place to start. And but how to do that on a big scale, I don't know. Yeah, me, me too. Um, that's why this thing is called Open Global Mind, by the way. <clears throat> it's very much about being open-minded, whatever the heck that means, right? Um, and I think we'll, we'll, we'll have governance issues at some, if, if we succeed, we're going to have a whole bunch of governance troubles. Um, uh, there's a whole, a whole lot of material I can go into there, but uh, you reminded me to bring in this no notion of design from trust because my own journey the last 25 years started 25 years ago when I was a tech industry trends analyst and realized I didn't like the word consumer. And the word consumer led me to understand that we've consumerized every sector of human activity, not just consumer goods, <clears throat> but our electoral system. The election we're in right now is a consumer mass marketing exercise where the candidates want a lot of money to pour into media to advertise to us, you know, to use consumer mass marketing. This is not really governance, right? Uh, and and every, <clears throat> every sector of human activity turned into consumer mass marketing. So I realized that we had basically been creating all these breaches of trust that we had institutionalized. We've poured concrete around not trusting humans. And so one of my naive beliefs is that when people have a little experience of this thing I call design from trust, first, it feels really weird. So I wrote, I wrote a piece I can post here. Um, if you go to designfromtrust.com, you'll find two essays at the top. <clears throat> one of them is you love design from trust, you just don't know it yet. And the second one is the two oh shits. <clears throat> and the two oh shits, I'll, I'll, I'll give away the, store, uh, the story here. Um, the two shits are when people hit a system that's designed from trust, like Wikipedia is, excuse me, what's when people hit a system that's designed from trust, like Wikipedia, when, and almost everybody's had this experience of thinking about, well, how does this work? I say, <clears throat> do you remember that feeling you had the moment you realized how Wikipedia works? Not that, oh, great, here's an encyclopedia, but, oh, wait, any idiot on earth can change any page on this thing. What? <clears throat> probably like your sphincter tightened, you got a little tightening in your throat. Like people have this, oh shit reaction, this is impossible, right? A lot of people have that, that's a very natural reaction. And to me, that's evidence of how deep we are down the rabbit hole of not trusting humans. <clears throat> then maybe you stayed with it and you went and looked into the Wikipedia in an area that you know a lot about. And you might've had a second oh shit reaction, which is, oh shit, this seems to be working. And my amateur theory is that if you have that little taste of, oh wow, that worked and it was really different from the norms, from the things I'm used to, from the things that seem to just have taken over the world, you will look for more of them. But we don't know what else is like that. <clears throat> we, don't, <clears throat> excuse me, we don't have a thesis to tell us where to look and what it is that, that was interesting about this. So anybody who's done an open space meeting, a self-organizing meeting, that's another example of design from trust. And people are completely freaked out by open space meetings. I've, I've facilitated many uh, Nancy is a world-class facilitator of all sorts of, 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 of processes and, and so forth. Um, but hosts, uh, hosts who are bringing me in to facilitate an open space meeting all the time have the reaction, yes, but what if nobody stands up and says, I think we should talk about this and shouldn't we plant some of those? Like, shouldn't we have some people prepared with great, great topics? I'm like, ixnay. 
like just just <clears throat> trust this process because people will wake up and the right issues can show up in the room if you make room for them and if you trust the humans involved. <clears throat> so my own my belief is that this is a contagious act that being open as Judy said we can be here but picking from the best of practices in the world, tribal practices, open source community practices, uh, governance practices from countries, whatever. I mean, th there's just this, we're, we're very sort of xenophobic uh, in the US. We, we think we're the, the greatest, best country there's ever been. And so we don't look around a lot. And there's a whole bunch of people done a whole bunch of good work around the world that, that's completely remixable. So I would love OGM to look around and as we're busy trying to figure out what this container is and how we run it and what it does. And I'd love it to host commercial ventures. I'd love people to be able to make a living, living inside of OGM. That'd be fabulous. And I can explain uh, one, a couple ideas like that, that, that I have in mind. But, <clears throat> but, but I think, um, uh, yes, Nancy's writing that there's an interesting side thread on saying trust the process in the Black Lives uh, Matter movement, by the way, which is, it, it, what I love about the moment is that <clears throat> it's causing us to question a whole bunch of things that I've been pointing to for a long time as designed from mistrust. So policing, for example, policing is a gigantic, raw, expensive, terrifying issue. And right now the conversation in the public sphere is one that I've been trying to figure out, how do you provoke this? How do you get people to start looking at restorative justice, at community policing, at trust, you know, and all of those are, are alternative methods that are designed from trust where the assumption is that people are acting in good faith and that the exception is people who are genuinely evil and who are trying to destroy the system, who exist, <clears throat> who exist, but who would like to jump in? Uh, Ken. Uh, I just want to know, it's a little bit like a fire hose this morning. There's so many things flying by here and I want to, oh, I want to jump on that. I want to jump on this. And it's like, so I'm not quite sure where I'm going to go here, but I, I want to back up to um, you're mentioning uh, James Queer and that, you know, you can convince somebody who's close to you. But if you want to talk to someone who's really far apart, the best way to do that is to give them a book and let them in their privacy, their own minds, their own, their own space to absorb new ideas that are really, <clears throat> excuse me, threatening to their, to their identity. And um, a few years ago after Ferguson, uh, a couple of friends and I, African-American friends and I, um, uh, we put on a, um, a two-day workshop around uh, listening to race. We chose the, the, the phrase listening because we don't feel people are ready to talk about race, especially white people. Um, most of us can't stay in our bodies. As soon as we're accused of being privileged, all the hormones start flowing and we either leave the room or we just leave our body and we go into reactive mind. And so uh, the reason it was a two-day workshop was the first day was simply tuning into the body and finding out what happens when you get triggered and how can you recognize the early warning signs and then shift your breathing, your <clears throat> something to lower that and go, oh, I'm just being triggered here. I can be triggered by anything, right? So if I can be aware of that in my body, then I can start to take control and I can recognize that when things come up and people say something, it's not about me personally, it's about who I represent in a system, right? And we ran this thing for about uh, four times and, and it was really incredible. We had people in tears, you know, the, 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 the uh, trust part was we put people in groups of three and we treat racism like trauma. And in trauma, you can be traumatized when you are the perpetrator of trauma. You can you get traumatized when you're the victim of trauma and you get traumatized when you're the witness of trauma. If we frame racism as trauma in that way, then all of us have been traumatized by racism. And what we did is we put people in groups of three and had them tell stories of when is a time when you were traumatized by racism as either the recipient of it or the, the perpetrator or the witness. And in that listening, when there was time after the person, it was after the first person went, the other two people could only name what went on in their bodies or their emotions. You know, oh my God, my stomach just clenched when I heard that, or I felt this rage come up, right? They couldn't comment on the, on the actual content. It was just what's going on for me. Again, anchoring back into the body. And we had to stop after, after four go-rounds because we realized 
we'd run through all the people that we knew that we felt were trustworthy to come in and we didn't want to open up to the public because we couldn't guarantee physical safety for some people coming in, right? So one of the, um, my friend Diane Woods, who's a, a wonderful woman who, who has done a lot of work, she's an African-American, she says, I'm black, I'm lesbian, I'm left-handed. The whole world's been against me from day one, right? And um, she said, you know, one of the things you can do you don't have to go out and try and convince a, a KKK person to convert. But when your uncle tells that racist joke, just say, you know what, that's not okay. I'm not gonna repeat that joke and I don't appreciate when you repeat that joke. That's kind of moving to the, where do you have connection with people who are exhibiting racist tendencies? And a lot of people at family events, oh, I don't wanna, I don't wanna stir up Uncle Joe. Be ready to stir up Uncle Joe. You know, just stand up and say, hey, that's not okay. I don't appreciate that. And I don't think, you know, you're better than that. That's what I love. She says, you're better than that. Don't denigrate them. Say, call them to a higher, a higher standard. So I wanted to, uh, oh, thank you for grandma's hands, Charles. I just saw that flash up. I, I just want to throw that out as <laughs> and Philip one too. of the things I like to see in Open, open Global Mind is sort of a, a mind-body map of, where are the things in Open Global Mind that you're really attracted to? Your body goes, oh, I love that a lot. And what are the things that make you go, I'm not sure. And what are the things that make you go, oh my God, I want to run away from this. So we can start to map the, the somatic intelligence and the emotional intelligence into the, onto the ideas map. So I just want to throw that out there as a, as a you know, whatever that's worth. <clears throat> um, that's fabulous. And I completely agree with the fire hose and I apologize for that because right. um, that, that sometimes is my, <clears throat> I'm sometimes really good at just listening and tracking your conversation and managing other people talking. But here I feel like I'm trying to paint in tiny little, little paint brushes, little, tiny little strokes, a pretty complicated, way too ambitious vessel, container, thing, movement, I don't know what it is, maybe religion, um, that um, has a whole bunch of origins, has a whole bunch of purposes, might be just too complicated to try to do. And yet I, I'm like, I'd love, to, I'd love to be able to do that. So my apologies on the fire hose uh, to you in the booth, Judy. I just had a question and this is maybe a stupid idea, but given what we're trying to do, would there be a way to use the brain to actually create a separate subbrain on one global mind and let everybody post all of their thoughts about different dimensions and, and just let one OGM dendritically grow rapidly in that mode. The complexity is we don't get to hear each other and I love hearing other people's point of view directly, but I'm also looking at a way to populate the content quickly to allow us to pick subzones, you know, cause I might choose this corner to explore more fully. Ken might choose another corner to explore more fully or feel that that's where he can contribute. I always love what you say, Ken, about somatic integration and the pausing to let people emotionally respond and notice their own responses because that's part of that openness piece that we're talking about. So I'm just wondering if that might be an experiment we could conduct that would be helpful. So um, a couple of things. Um, I'm, I'm kind of the only person who's put any thoughts in this particular brain file and the brain is proprietary software and, and there is a version called team brain. So one possibility is convincing the brain to let us use team brain and to let a bunch of people come in and start doing that. <clears throat> but if we started from scratch, we don't get the benefit of the work I put into sort of creating all the stuff on OGM and why and wherefore and you know, of, of everything we've mentioned, like 80% of all the things that have come up in the conversation so far, partly because I've put them in there, are already in my brain. And I'm not sure about grandmother's, grandma's hands, but I'm going to go check, et cetera, right? So, so there's already this rich context. And one of the objectives of OGM is to create an environment where different people can preserve their own perspective on the world and then remix it and compare and contrast it and then step back to only what they know to be true <clears throat> what they've got curated or what, they've, what they care about, which the brain does not permit. It doesn't, it doesn't really allow for that kind of collaboration. So if we did do a team brain, <clears throat> it'd be a little bit like Wikipedia where we'd wind up having to agree with what's here, what's there, or we'd have to figure out some workaround where we would name different perspectives differently. I don't know exactly what, how we would conquer that. And that, that's sort of one set of issues. Another issue is, um, 
that, um, oh, sorry, I forgot which, which thread I was going on there. Oh, I know. Uh, I've been toying with the idea of super distributing my brain, right? So, so far, I'm the only person who's had anything to my brain. What if I put my brain philosophically into a GitHub or a GitHub equivalent, and I, I allow basically fork and pull on my brain? Now, architecturally, I don't think that'll work with a brain, but let's just imagine that that worked. And for anybody who's, who's not familiar with GitHub, GitHub is where open source code has gone mostly these days. Uh, and what happens is uh, you, everybody has a repository of their, of their code base. Uh, anybody on GitHub can fork, meaning make, make a full copy of your code base. They can go take all of your code and go off and play with it. And then if they figure out something better to do in some part of your code, they submit a pull request. So it's called fork and pull. And they submit to you a request that says, hey, I fixed something over here. Would you like to include it in your code base? Because that way, the central code stays central and everybody gets the benefits from all the different people trying to improve the code. It's called fork and pull. <clears throat> I would, you know, and people are writing a book. There's a website called Gitbook that uses mm -hmm. fork and pull to author chapters and sections of books, which I find incredibly interesting. If we all wanted to do something like that, I would love to do that, right? Um, so partly my question is, what can we try? And then, and then the third thing I'll throw into the, the mix of it, trying to answer that great question, Judy, is, there are other tools like Rome research, and I know a couple of people developing Rome-like things that are much more open, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe we use a variety of tools to try to do this, and we sort of bring them in and start saying, how do we remix this? What do we do? But I think, I think part of our problem in this early going of the conversation is we have a lack of the tool that ought to exist, and we need to kludge our way toward it, and then we need to somehow maybe motivate people to design towards something we might specify. And some of us, whoever shows up here who are coders, might decide to go build a couple little strategic pieces that fit in there. And Charles, thank you for your patience. Over to you. Oh, thanks. Um, wow, I'm just really glad to be here. And I did put a number of things in the chat. So you, you made a reference or others um, a few times today already to Wikipedia. Um, and as I put in the chat, you'll find um, links for uh, an amazing guy I just came to know um, actually a week and a half ago called Pete Forsyth, who I think really um, would be glad to join us. He <laughs> belongs here in my view. Um, Wiki Strategies is his company. He's an advisor consultant around Wikipedia, but he's got really deep, deep insight um, and, and learnings also having been in Wikimedia Foundation for a couple of years, uh, a number of years ago, and has a, a, a deep uh, social justice uh, dimension in terms of where he's coming from. Um, and I also put a link for this Afro crowd, which I just heard about through him. He's been very involved in that project, um, for example. Um, and so just to efficiently riff a, li a little bit more in terms of this, um, uh, what did you call it, in terms of the forking, uh, sorry, I, I did, I did write, uh, super, super distributing your brain yeah. and sort of forking the code base and all this. So uh, you, you uh, Jerry, or elders here probably know much more than me about um, uh, Federated Wiki, but I've been hearing about it and kind of like sniffing around at the doorway of that, which is very much about forking um, in, the, in the Wiki space. But I think I, I just, um, and you, you know, I, I sort of came, came to this idea last week and I wrote a little more in, in the forum in, in terms of helping um, you and us together make your brain actionable in some way. Maybe uh, an interesting thing to think about is actually to, uh, I think very much with, with Pete, because he's really a, a, you know, a com compatriot, um, uh, just sort of getting that into Wikipedia, other, you know, and, and or Federated Wiki. So maybe that's enough for me at the moment. I have others, other things. I'll probably have to cut out shortly after the top of the hour, but um, that's, that's a bunch of stuff right there. Thanks. Thank you. Um, that's that's fabulous. Um, and Ward uh, Ward is a friend and lives here in, in in Portland. And there's a whole bunch of groups that I've been tracking for a really long time that have been working on different pieces of this. Um, unfortunately, a lot of them are composed of white guys, so I haven't been in, I have intentionally not been inviting them to the early conversations here, so that we might cultivate a diverse conversation here. Uh, yeah. And and also, there are a whole bunch of really strong. Um, groups that are, are developing a very particular um, approach on this, whether it's holacracy or, or and, and, uh, like each of you probably is thinking about, oh, this is kind of like that, but boy, that's a big movement. And, and I'm interested in how do we, how are you useful to those movements, but I'm not necessarily 
that interested in making uh, OGM a hol holocratic enterprise because that's fraught with a whole bunch of its uh, of its own complexities. But how can okay, we pick, I, how can just, we pick the best of these things? Go ahead, Charles. Just a, a, one more quick Susan. comment. I, I'm sorry, just um, to, to interrupt. But um, on Wikipedia, one of the things um, that I've been learning or sort of realizing through, through talking with Pete foresight recently it's it's the oldest um sort of major significant website like older than all the kind of other major stacks players and so forth and they don't and, and it's the only one that doesn't harvest data and and so that's pretty interesting right. to think about of the top 10 websites it's the only one that doesn't leave cookies and track you and all that kind of stuff susan can you repeat that website for me i missed it w which one wiki strategies perhaps Okay. Wiki strategies. Cool. I, I think it's the one you're asking, maybe. Yeah. That doesn't track. Uh, Wikipedia is the only one that doesn't track. Of the top ten uh, trafficked websites oh, right. in uh, honor, exactly. the only one that's not busy tracking us is Wikipedia. Susan, go over to you. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that I've been, <clears throat> excuse me, watching go by, in the conversation is a couple of things that could be candidates for. Um, well, I call it a basket, a bushel, or something, of um, of principles that would be provoke conversation. So, one that comes to mind, as you were describing, fork and pull, is reciprocity. Um, it, reciprocity is is you know one of those, right? And if 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 whenever one of these ideas, one of these other platforms comes forward, or get we get around to designing or doing anything with what whatever this turns into, we could have a list of, I don't know, again, three or four <laughs> that say, do they, does it have this property? And it doesn't mean that if it doesn't have this property that we don't use it, it's just that it will have to be managed. Um, so I was, I was, uh, I don't know where to put that list. Yes, see? <laughs> so <clears throat> I love that. And, and I've been talking about these as sort of buckets. And what I'm interested in is which buckets have interest for you all, for, for you all who are here in this conversation. And a bucket, for example, is discourse, dialogue, deliberation. How, how does that work? How do we hold that space? What, where does that go? Another mm -hmm. bucket is this architectural layer down, down, and mentally for me, down below where we are, where we can create shared data that we can improve instead of each having our own little silo of data. Another bucket is how do we build for-profit models on top of, you know, what is our governance structure and how do we make how do we start businesses on here and what does that look like and and i think in this conversation we've probably sort of brushed by a dozen buckets like that and that was part of what made this feel like the torrent uh you know in the conversation was that was that i was kind of trying to paint some of these buckets quickly and my goal here is to figure out how do we organize ourselves so that we can find our way into those sub conversations yes. and then how do we have those rich sub conversations in a way that's brain like or ogm like meaning that we can annotate it and collect it up uh, and, 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 and share it back somehow. And then can we have one place, and I'm, I'm gonna start a little simple Google Doc for a while <clears throat> as, as this, this collection point that says, okay, here are the buckets we've got going so far, which are kind of sub projects. And here's a snapshot of where this, this group has gotten to as of this moment. And ask anybody who's off doing side conversations to make sure that that page reflects the current status of that particular group's work. Um, and that would be just a, a gentle way of trying to stay on the same page and a gentle way of letting newcomers go in and say, oh, I'm, you know, I don't have a strong point of view, but I love getting things done. Uh, and I'm calling that a builder. Um, I'd like to go help somebody build something. And here's the list of projects. I'm going to go over here and knock on the door and see if I can't help like execute on, on what this project looks like. That, that, that's kind of the goal here functionally is, is how, do, how do we organize this thing up so that it's loose but has enough handrails on it that people can find their way to those places. And I did want, I did want to make this an hour long call. I'm happy to stay after. Um, I'm used to 90 minute calls. I love 90 minute calls, but they tend to be too long to listen to later, et cetera, et cetera. So if you need to boogie at the top of the hour, awesome. I will stay on for a little, a little while longer. Uh, but I just want to first like appreciate everybody for being here. And Charles, you have something you'd like to throw in and you do have to go. Um, yeah, I'll go shortly in a couple of minutes, but I'm, yeah, just really, resonating um, not just today but in general with the whole thing and I've been a little bit um, profligate on the on the forum but um, and, and and just to mention I, I created a telegram group um, without asking I just you know I use telegram a lot maybe some of you would, would appreciate that I think it'll be useful for sharing things between different groups there and um, kind of cross-pollinating <clears throat> um, 
And it just occurred to me um, to ask this question about your podcasts, sort of slash uh, Jerry's Brain conversations, and in terms of conversations that um, can be, how and when can they be more open in the sense of, of inviting people or curating certain people, but but also just putting some mm-hmm. things out there in the form of conversations. Do you have something in mind in terms of bridging that effort, which you've been doing for for quite a while, um, and this one? Um, yes. So I, I'm sort of repurposing everything I've got out there. So I've got a, a vlog series called Inside Jerry's Brain, which I think I'm going to invite those people, you know, over over here and and kind of know that uh, there's a, a series of different places. And for OGM. We have a little fledgling website, which I built on Google Sites, which I'd love anybody who wants to help build out the website, tell me and I'll give you admin privileges to edit that. <clears throat> um, we have a LinkedIn group, which is cur- Charles has written the only post on that one. <clears throat> and, and part of the conversation here is, where do we have which conversation? So as I see it in my head right now, um, I, the, 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 the Google group mailing list for Open Global Mind to me is like the inside conversation for how are we doing this? It's a little bit like this conversation we just had now. And and we're posting this conversation publicly to YouTube. So anybody can come in and watch it later. But but the the, the mailing list is kind of like the inside conversation. For me, the LinkedIn group is a more outside facing conversation that isn't about publishing. It isn't about posting, but it's it's how do we talk about OGM like principles with anybody who's on LinkedIn, which is it's got its own boundaries, but but it's, it's a more public conversation about that. And then I created a, a Medium channel. So if we wanted to co-author articles and post them on Medium, there's a channel called Open Global Mind that's just sitting there. There's no articles posted to it yet. As soon as I finish Trust, melt, Lockdown, and Meltdown, I'll probably post it to that. But then I, I want to write a whole uh, manifesto-y kind of piece about what is OGM and, and like what is this thing and post that on that channel. And so then the question becomes, how many is too much? Oh, and the last thought there before I go to Judy is, um, <coughs> different work groups who are doing different buckets or whatever we want to call these things may end up wanting to go on completely different platforms. So the geeky platform conversation may happen on Reddit or, or um, Substack or, or uh, sorry, um, Stack Exchange or someplace where, where technical people congregate and, and can understand and share code. Um, the Telegram group you just started, Charles, may, may find a special purpose for governance conversations or something else. And as long as each of these is feeding back to a central place where we can figure out, okay, to go find the conversation link here, and here's where, where we are right now, I think that's great. And I think that, that the diversity will help us understand how these things all work together and what to do together. Uh, Judy, go ahead. Uh, apologies for the phone that I forgot to turn off in the background. Um, the, the question that I'm wondering about is whether at some point we might want to shift this just a little bit to an experimental model where we're actually engaging different people and feeding the results of that back into some collection point because this ends up being, it's much more than a thought exercise in terms of where we want it to go. And so I don't know how to do that, but I just wanted to get the thought in the stream of consciousness. I think what I'm describing and intending is very much what you just said. And so I don't know where the difference is between what you thought I said and what you're saying. And I'd love to elaborate on that. So that's a great question. Okay. Yeah. Mine had to do with actually the dimension of reaching people mm-hmm. in terms of their sense of connection, our learning from them, developing a common viewpoint. And maybe and, we're going to do that all digitally. But And partly I want OGM to be a little bit like a slime mold. Uh, in the sense that we'll sort of go go colonize and, and wrap ourselves around another organization, invite them in, see if there's a symbiotic relationship and sort of move on from there. And, and so I see that one of the groups, one of the buckets might be kind of outreach. And it's like, all right, who, and I have a long list in my brain. I, it, it's called o, OGM neighbor communities is the thought where I keep this. Um, and it's basically lots and lots of existing projects on all these different lo- levels uh, and communities like the Game B community that Jim Rudd has nurtured. There's like a ton of these. And so in what order and how do we, how do we reach out to them and how do we figure out what might our, our symbiosis, what is the basis for our, our symbiosis uh, in doing so? And I think that fits what you're saying. So in that sense, I, I want to sort of lather, rinse, repeat on that. Charles. Back to, well, symbiosis, interoperability, I think th- this is this is all great and really rich. And so just to kind of go back a bit before I have to duck out um, to the conversation question, 
and thank you for really that amazing list that you, you, you basically um, just laid out for us. And, and, and just a reminder to self and, and anyone who wants to get involved in, in the authorizing process or, or any other sort of useful transcription mm -hmm of all of these and, and kind of sense making of that. But I think, you know, I didn't write down the whole list just now, but I think it's all there. <clears throat> For example, now those are, um, let's call them asynchronous um, and more, you know, text-based conversations. I am actually, it was, it didn't specify, um, I was referring more to synchronous, uh, I mean, recorded, so asynchronous after the fact, but, you know, live, you know, people to people conversations like here and now. Um, like you have, you know, on on the jury's brain, inside jury's brain conversations, for example. So, um, just just to kind of, you know, because you didn't actually in your list mention that aspect of conversation. Right? I didn't hear it. Mention, sorry, mention which aspect? The synchronous person to person um, in a space in real time. Um, and I think that we're going to have a mix. Where like uh, I. Sub projects will set up their own schedule of calls. I, I expect to be like on hopefully in, in lots of different kinds of conversations that are more that are more targeted around this. Um, and then I'm hoping that everybody records and posts and uses the same hashtags or puts them in the same place and we'll sort of figure that out so that someone could come in and go back and look at you know what happened where and, and whatever else. Um, by the way, Charles, I don't know if you know this, but the reason we're using uh, Hank and the Collective Next Zoom room right now and not mine is that their account uh, has an, uh, they've set it so that it does automatic transcription of the conversation. Mm -hmm. So that is being generated. We don't need to go to Otter. Um, that is being generated already. Um, Perfect. Which is great. And, I'll, and I'll share that out with everybody. I did not know that that was even a, a feature that was so, possible. So that's a feature from Zoom itself. As far as I understand it, yes. It's not. No, Nancy's shaking her head. Cause I know, I know Otter has an integration, but go ahead. It's an integration. With Otter? Yeah. Oh, well, how about that? But it's a paid integration. Somebody Otter talk about that. I was thinking of an otter pun, but I was trying to hold back. Why would you hold back puns, Nancy? I because feel I'm like thinking about other things too, puns. not just puns. I, I, I just want to circle back to something you wrote in your invitation, which is how to have conversations with people who aren't um, aligned. Because what I'm, I'm currently living in rural Skagit County up in Washington State, and I follow two community Facebook pages because I'm situated between two. Well, I'm situated actually between three communities. And the speed at which hateful invective is triggered by the smallest thing in a Facebook community page to me is a fundamental issue that needs immediate attention and love and care. And I am no way equipped to do it um, based on my current life circumstance, but want to support it. And that to me, you know, it's like having having a meal with something or somebody you disagree with. I mean, that that's kind of fundamental finding what we have in common before we deal with what we don't have in common. Or Ken's, you know, like how did that feel? Um, because you know, every time I read one of these threads, I'm I'm feeling it. I'm I'm feeling it here first and not here, and I'm seeing it just activate everyone else. So for me, I think something that we could do now that taps into open global mind taps into the need of the moment as an experiment so somebody wrote experiment earlier um, and maybe it was you Judith um, my brain is now on overload um, might be a way to both examine what can we do now how do we do it in a way that is generative and useful and can spread mycelially like what is what are the hyphae of this process um, and it might even generate some of those answers to, or some hypotheses or experiments to the questions around structure and governance, though. I think I've gotten too old for structure and governance. <laughs> <laughs> I sort of resist thinking, oh, let someone else deal with that. I'll just wow. do whatever they say, but I'm done with that shit. You can just show up. Um, uh, because I failed at every attempt I've ever made. <laughs> um, uh, and, you know. So th that's an ephemeral piece that maybe all is always changing. So I, I would really uh, deeply appreciate something that we could use as a test bed for all the swirling idea. Because, you know, I look at, you know, there's three pages of this, right? Um, what to do with it and how to each of us somehow pull a thread of it into our own work or context. So I'm doing it with you, but I'm also doing it with it over here. So I'm, I'm, I'm actually, whatever experiment we do, 
I'm also doing it here because again, we're gonna have more connections out and then it could give me enough of an anchor to say, I'm gonna prioritize this and show up because I love this conversation and how do I prioritize in a, in a time when there's so many opportunities to do something useful? Um, yes, 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 completely. So several things. Um, one is I'd love to prioritize and focus on anything that we might do that furthers what you're trying to do. So, so Nancy, if you want help on something that, that fits the OGM sort of thing, mm -hmm. like articulate it and say, anybody interested in blank, and then we'll see who shows up and then we'll try to try to make that our activity as well. So that, so that we're not busy doing some, some neutral thing that ha that's not valuable to somebody in the group. Right. But then second, this group and the people I'm inviting to the conversation um, intentionally, our network crosses into world-class state-of-the-art doers on all the things we're talking about. Like, like we can invite in the best of thinkers on how to reduce online hatred and whatever. We know them. Like, like we can knock on their door and say, hey, would you run a session for us? And would you tell us how to shape this or whatever? And, and I'm really interested in being the meeting ground for the best thinking and the best prototyping and experimenting on all these things and then trying to create a way where we can feed back what worked and what didn't work and creating learning loops so that we can actually improve that and put that out in the world and say hey you know we've, we're trying to take a look at online hate and how things degrade and we suggest these four practices which we didn't invent by the way there's a group over here that's been doing that for a really long time they invented it and we just love it right and and things that we certify by loving them and by, by, by putting them out forward will hopefully get traction and be useful to more people. But it would be nice if we could be, become sort of a, a resource for everybody else doing these, the different pieces of work that we're talking about. Does that make sense? Uh, Neil. Yeah, thanks. Loved what you said there, Nancy, about failing in governance. Um, I, uh, I tried to develop a United Nations Regional Centre of Expertise for Education for Sustainability in the Murray-Darling Basin in Australia. So this is an area bigger than some uh, American states. Um, and the, there were three key principles that I came up with and two of them are relevant here. One was how do we create receptacles of multiple wisdoms, right? And mutual respect for Aboriginal community you know, in, you know, right the way through to expert. So the mutual respect across those broad streams, not just disciplines. Secondly, how do we operate with a level of uh, ethics higher than the existing institutions, right? Because the existing institutions are failing and therefore there is no trust. So you don't have governance in the absence of trust. So the third question that I asked there was, well, two questions. What is it we could do together we can't do alone? And this is, you know, questions we were asking back to the community. And the other one was, what is it we need to become to help you do what you know needs to be done? And the reason I'm mentioning that is that this, uh, what you're talking about here strikes me at two levels. There's the, the online community, which is uh, an esoteric virtual community where we need to uh, demonstrate by example how to engage people across difference to try and manage the sort of things Nancy was talking about. Those, differences that become dangerous invective and then potentially become violence. Secondly, on the ground, what does a real community look like? And when you go into a real community, you're not dealing with a rarefied atmosphere of self-selected people. You're dealing with a geographically co-located bunch of people with multiple different worldviews. And so the way in which you uh, hold this receptacle of multiple wisdoms and the way the processes and engagement mechanisms that you use to bring people in will depend about will depend much on whether that's a self-selected group i think it was mentioned earlier like this group that's been and thank you very much for inviting me in ken invited to come together around a common attractor and people that show up to a community meeting to fight the existing authorities right and so how do you get to that point of how do we enable real outcomes on the ground unless we hold the capability, maturity and capacity to engage across difference. My sense from the brief introductions here is we've probably got a couple of spiral wizards here who are able to sense into, listen into, feel you know, bodily 
where is that individual? Where is this collective? Where is the critical energy? Where, where are things moving? What's the next stepping stone that I could put in front of people? And so there's going to be different roles for those that have the content, those that have the process, and those that can sense the movement, direction, opportunity, risk, and navigate landscapes in real time. And I'm, I'm really keen to see how a tool like this, which is I'm coming to newly, uh, but it has resonance with many things I've tried in the past. You know, it's a source of information, content, and obviously lovely people. What does that look like applied in a virtual community and a real community? And are they some of the examples that Nancy and others are talking about? Um, Neil, thank you. That's that's fabulous. And let me let me add a, a little thing here before I forget it, and then go to Judy. Um, I'm a big fan of restorative justice, but I met a woman a couple of years ago um, uh, who had come up with something. I think she called it integrative justice, and for some strange reason, I'm not seeing it in my brain. Uh, but she had a critique of restorative justice that was really interesting, and her process, which has gotten zero traction as far as I can tell. Um, but her process basically said, in, a, in many cases, a situation on the ground is caused by, by things in outer layers of institutional design of, of stupid things that are happening in the system. And so her process was attempting to fix the system, which always seems like tilting at windmills to most people because the system is poured in concrete and it's so hard and it won't change. But we're in this really weird moment of flux. We're in this moment where things have melted. And I, I love the difference between elastic and plastic. <clears throat> like like elastic rubber always goes back to its original shape, but something that's plastic can melt and be reformed and reshaped into something new. So I prefer plastic in, in that sense because you can reform it. Not all plastics. I'm no petrochemical engineer. Um, but how how might we continue working on you know, so so I was a big proponent of RJ for a long time, and then I'm like, oh wait, why don't we rethink even that and try to figure out how, how to make this better? And I think I think entering a way to intervene with the system at the system level, like Donnell, applying some Donella Meadows leverage here um, intelligently could solve a lot of the lower level problems. And the reason I came up with design from trust is that my amateur theory is that if we can get people to start designing <coughs> institution systems, processes, whatever, from an assumption that most people are good actors and to delay clamping down on what everybody can do in the way we do uh, to deal with bad actors, to delay that as long as possible and to try to make as many bad actors good actors as possible, that that general principle would help us design institutions in every sector much better, that the, that, that, that would be an, an, an interesting intervention. So I'd love to have that conversation multiply and I think, I think that, you know, maybe, I don't know what to call it. Is that the, the Meadows group or the leverage conversation or the intervention conversation, Neil? just unmuting. Um, I've been playing with the concept of a systems design alliance and a systems design laboratory. And every country town is a systems design laboratory, right? My sense, my sense is that every city is going to fail with what's, what we know is in the pipeline. However, country towns have geo uh, located uh, groups of people who have greater binding and greater recognition of mateship or integrative uh, recognition of at least the interdependence on the water system or the energy system or the local economy. And so there's a scale issue here, uh, but there's an opportunity here to say, how do we, and I think you were referring to this earlier, Jerry, how do we plug in the relevant skills in the relevant places in the communities that welcome us, not the ones that force us to go away? So my host communities model is based around finding welcoming communities that recognize the need for change, know the existing system cannot deliver it, and are seeking outside intervention to assist them to co-design and co-define what needs to be done. And so Systems Design Alliance is one name that I'd throw in there, but again, depends on whether you're applying it virtually, real, what scale, and where you draw the boundaries, depends on how big your slime mold wants to be. I Neil, love that. Or, could I just, yeah. Uh, I just want to say I would love OGM to be a petri dish where we can where we can build out some some systems uh, design laboratories. That would be fabulous, Susan. I just uh, just wanted to comment on Neil's list that he just gave there, which sounded to me a lot like <coughs> qualifying criteria. Um, I don't want to give us all checklists to the end of time, 
but I, 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 did, I did find Atul Gawande's story <laughs> originally very compelling. And, um, and it's a discipline that, about that, yeah. yeah, that we could, you know, I see these collections of things that keep popping up. And what the other comment I wanted to make, and then I have to go, but the, uh, is that uh, to go back to uh, Jerry over recognize this question, um, which is why isn't the internet already this? Um, and um, there are many reasons why it's not. I knew the answer to that to, to start with. But what the one thing that I think now that I think should be preserved is that feeling of um, uh, is that feeling of uh, of discovery and fun of actually finding something that you didn't know existed and to find things that you do. I mean, I've, I, I mean, it taught me, you know, that everything has been thought about. <laughs> the first thing you should think is this is not a new idea. Who's been thinking about it? You know, where's that gone? Blah, 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 blah. So, and that's, that's a, that's a look and feel kind of a, a thing, right? So I'm just looking for buckets, I guess. And um, I, I just, you know, for the look and feel thing, I'd like it to be like it was in the beginning, which was, um, as Jeff Nunberg so nicely put it, like Venice. Mm. You quite, don't quite know where you are. You go around the next the corner and you go, oh, wow. Yeah. Um, it is lost answer. that because of advertising completely. Yeah, Br brief answer to your question. The internet is one of my examples of design from trust, and I contrast it with the old phone system with POTS, the plain old telephone system mm -hmm. and, its, and its design. <clears throat> and then the, originally the internet shows up and it is wild and woolly and open, <clears throat> excuse me, and has a lot of these characteristics we're talking about. And then business discovers it. And then the largest entities on the net now are basically um, consumer mass marketing platforms that are busy hoovering up our information and selling it off. And that's how they make enough money to become the largest entities on earth. And that is actually an issue in public discourse right now. Wow. Um, and, and we had this weird naive idea that if we just like let everybody do everything for free and communicate openly in all these places without solving any of the systemic problems around it, that that might play out okay. And it turns out that that's fueled a whole bunch of different things and that we have misunderstandings and that like we're just like, we're on training wheels with this, this actually, we're in the training wheel stage except our vehicle doesn't have training wheels. Our vehicle is very real and is influencing a whole lot of people and a whole lot of things. So any efforts, you know, and, and I would love to wrap in some of the best of the conversations about this topic that we, that we can find in the world and figure out, okay, good. How do, we, how do we help that gain traction? How do we help that cause change? That'd be great. So fabulous question. I think there's a, there's a big bucket around that. I don't know what to, what to name it. And, and just, I have a whole series of projects I've thought of and haven't done much with. Uh, for example, uh, I have a placeholder religion at foobarism.com. <laughs> Foobar, you know, fucked up beyond all recognition. Exactly. <laughs> Foobar in, for programmers, foo.bar is also a placeholder file name. So when you're coding or writing about code, you, you can say like, then there's this file we have to move, foo.bar. And so I just bought the domain foobarism thinking if you had to invent a new uh, religion, the way that uh, Dianetics you know, L. Ron Hubbard basically invents Scientology as a bar bet. You know, mm. he makes a bet in a bar that he can invent a religion and get people to adhere to it, and boom, there you have Scientology. Um, so tongue in cheek, what would a belief system look like that adheres to this conversation? Like, what is that, right? How do we do that? And, and the, I don't have much on the website, it's nascent, but the thing, I went around looking at, at world sort of, uh, guidance systems. And I looked at, I have a whole riff I have on the 10 commandments uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll steal my own thunder here. Nobody knows the second, try this sometime. Nobody knows the second commandment. Nobody can answer that question properly. One in a hundred people I've met, uh, Ken does. And the second commandment is no graven images. And you're like, I'm sorry, what does Christianity violate every single day? And what is it doing at number two anyway? Number one, by the way, is I'm your only God. There will be no other gods, which is licensed to kill people who believe in other gods, as far as I can tell. Right. <laughs> and you know, the don't kill, don't steal, which are still like, seriously, shouldn't we have more interesting things before don't kill, don't steal? But those are five, six, seven, eight, right? So I went looking around and my favorite one is from Thich Nhat Hanh. It's deep listening and loving speech. And, and the golden rule, I think it's misapplied a lot. So I'm not crazy about the golden rule. And this is again, an interesting conversation over some wine, but, um, but what if as part of this 
project, we playfully fleshed out a, a mythical religion. And I think it has to be tongue in cheek because anything that takes itself too seriously and claims to be something big is not actually credible in that sense to me. Um, so, so, but that would give us a, a place to talk philosophically about some of these issues. And Susan, FUBAR is maybe the wrong container for that conversation, or it may be the right one, I don't know. <laughs> but I'm, I'm happy to put it in the mix. And it's got a little website on Google Sites, which is super easy to edit and collaboratively edit. Part of the reason that I love using Google Groups is that I use Google Groups as access control to uh, Google Drive files, to Google Documents, to everything else. Um, and, uh, and so it makes, it, it makes you know, admin a, a tiny bit easier. But I, I'm, you know, I'm leery of being all in on Google as well. And maybe we discover new and new and more interesting places to be on top of distributed file systems and DAX and DAOs and I don't know what. So anyway, sorry for the long riff. Um, we are nearing the end of 90 minutes. Uh, we should probably wrap. I just want to go quiet and see if anybody. Uh, Peter, thanks for joining the conversation. Um, how's life in Belgium? It's fine, but I mixed up uh, calendars, so I thought oh, shoot. 7, 7 p.m. our time with 7 a.m. your time. So I'm so sorry. Sorry about that, um, and I, and I'll uh, I'll make sure that the, the, our calendar entry is is reliable and so forth. But let me go quiet and see if anybody has anything they'd like to add on our way out. Judy, I just had a question: Is this now a regular time? Because I had initially a different regular time and was only lucky to find this. <laughs> uh, my apologies. I'm trying to make this a regular time. Uh, and the reason it's so early on the left coast is that I'm with the time, so. we have a couple participants who would like to be on from Hong Kong and Singapore, and they're not, they didn't make this call, but, but this is a reasonable time for, for that part of Asia. Um, so I'm, I count on this, and I'm going to set up a repeating appointment that we can all kind of use. The, the, comp, the complicating factor there is which Zoom link should be in the calendar event, because Zoom is tightening up its requirements, and, I'm, and we're using collective next Zoom, et cetera. So that's just a... a a tiny uh, complicating factor. Any other comments on our, uh, go ahead, Judy. Well, the other question I had was that it, it seemed to me that the actionability of all of this has to do with how we can connect with thought leaders and individuals of different thoughts to develop a collected wisdom. And that might be a topic for much more in-depth discussion in terms of what has worked or what experiments we could do and I mean experiments in the sense of how can we integrate personal experiences and effectiveness and different audiences and different complexities into the system becoming an agent of change. Love that. Love that. <clears throat> and I was, uh, there's a game, sorry, <clears throat> I didn't even have coffee this morning. My throat's a, a little coffee. Um, maybe that's why they call it coffee, but coffee. I didn't have coffee. Um, <laughs> So, so I was on Facebook. There's a Game B group on Facebook, Jim Rutt and a bunch of others. And I'm in there a week ago. And I, I think I said this. I, I think I was in that group an hour before the, the launch call for OGM. And there was clearly sort of an alt-right troll in there um, who was trolling the group. And they were sort of adapting and partly ignoring. And To me, it was really interesting to watch that on Facebook groups, you know, that set of technologies, how this was affecting the conversation. And, and I, I, that's a really important topic to me is like how, how to absorb and how to contain and how to respect, um, not just very different points of view, which I think are much easier, but intentional, uh, intentional undermining of discourse. <clears throat> and, and I think we're gonna need to figure some of that out uh, for ourselves uh, reasonably early. Um, and that gets complicated really fast. I don't know futures literacy. I just want to say <clears throat> thank you to the women for being on the call today because I've been on so many of these calls where there's one woman or no women and uh, I, I like to see more diversity here. And Neil, thanks so much for joining. I know you got dropped in on this and I can probably go, what the hell is going on here? But you made some wonderful contributions and it's good to see you face to face after all this back and forth on Facebook. And I want to warn people, do not get in a punning contest with Neil because he is merciless. Wait, 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 wait. You're like, you're like a sixth Dan black belt punner. So you're telling us... <laughs> You're telling us Neil is further up that Neil, ladder. Neil is he? he I, I, I we are. He's like my match, and maybe better. He's he just is he relentless. He just you know. Uh, Can we close with a Neil pun? 
<laughs> well, you're on muted. demand punning. You're, you're muted, yeah. Punning is opportunistic though, so I don't know it if is, it, but you, you gotta can, like call yourself, it up like this. <clears throat> yeah. We've just lost your You're still muted. Still muted. Can you unmute everybody, Jerry? Uh sorry, I found it. Oh, yes. Sorry. I, I, I wasn't going to uh, to drop in a pun, but I went to look for a poem. So forgive me, I got lost in, in medium. But I'll drop you a poem, which I think you'll enjoy. Ah, oh, no, it didn't come through. Hang on. How do I send that to the rest of the group? Post um, it in the chat here. Post yeah. the poem in chat. I thought I had copied If you have a URL it. to the poem or, or the whole Give poem. Give me one second and I will sure. grab that for you. Neil is and also I an accomplished photographer and poet. Love that. Just a and, slacker. Uh, and um, Ken is my new publicist. Um, <laughs> He's good. He's really good. Oh, I love this poem. And I just, oh, I, just posted, I just posted a poem called Home <laughs> to Roost, which is fabulous and is a poem for our times. I, I read it in the last uh, OGM call. Okay. Just, sorry about taking so long to get here. Nearly That's there, okay. I think. <clears throat> and will it post this time? Yes. So I hope you enjoy this. Oh, fabulous. And I can read it to you if you want. Yeah. Please do. Please that would do. be great. That'll, that'll take us out. Okay, so here we go. Um, just wait till it comes up. Why do I come here? I come here to masticate, to chew things over, mate to mate, investigate and cogitate, deliberate and correlate. It's not just words, it's not all lies. Divergent voices theorize for each new view a thread provides. A crucial link, a pile of lies, it doesn't matter. For each surprise or compromise might enlighten or comprise patterns found through group endeavor, a tapestry we weave together. Divergent views reverberate and separate and feed debate. At times we find we each dictate, gesticulate, sometimes berate and agitate and activate, force those that care to correlate and those that don't to postulate and imitate, adjudicate. So theorize, differentiate, see each part, discern, relate, internalize the ones that matter Adopt a stance that does not shatter this fragile space we share together. Let's co-imagine something better. Then ask yourself, why do you come to make a point or steal a run? Sometimes to procrastinate, sometimes more. To masturbate, to self-inquire, refine your views, to walk a mile in others' shoes, to find some friends and share the news, all through trust make colleagues new. Beyond debate, we correlate. Converging minds, we integrate. We co-define our language better. We co-design, make things that matter. Through dialogue, we realize and synthesize and crystallize divergent bits of different size, include the truths, reveal the lies. Dialogue is circular and sometimes perpendicular as tangents sprout and sidetracks form from me to you to me, then on and on and round and round it goes. With love, a spiral, not death throws. The words may grow, someone might shout, a song may form. A poem sprout. Actions speak, but words still matter. Most don't work without the latter. So as we forge through stormy weather and navigate our way together, we trust our friends to activate, back us up as mate does mate, continue to communicate and agitate, rejuvenate and strive always to co-relate. One thing I ask, my dearest mates, please don't just act, deliberate. For when you do, you'll find your way and maybe others with whom to play. It happens each and every day when people gather to have their say. Yay. Mm -hmm. well oh done. my God. Oh my God. Thank you. This, this is the, like the OGM poem. <laughs> and you've just, be and you, you have just become the first, National Anthem. the first OGM poet laureate. Well, thank you. I, I've actually been honored this week. I have, uh, I don't have the book in front of me. I've had one poem just recently published in the book of rituals from uh, a sister of mercy in Australia. And I'm the poet, uh, the house poet or poet laureate of an eco psychology uh, education site here in, in uh, Belgium. And I've been here for six months as of today, I think, or thereabouts. So <laughs> fabulous. fabulous. So, and, and Peter, Peter van der Oora is also in Belgium. So I don't know if you guys have ever met, uh, but you're locals. No, well, um, Peter, um, yeah, my, my email address is, is I can send that through, but we'll catch up sometime, Peter, and have a chat. So Beautiful. That sounds great. Um, everybody, thank you. You're, thank you're you. fabulous. I really. Wonderful way to start the day. Yeah. <laughs> thank Landers. you for the warm welcome. 
I'll, I'll go. So it's actually much. a bit later here. I'll go get my second beer. I'll be right. <laughs> Take Want care, coffee. everybody. Right. Ciao, ciao. Have a great day, everybody. Bye. Thanks, Bye -bye. everyone.